Hi and welcome back to my channel, I am Charlie Ari and this is the start of a new series that I'm going to be doing uh, called Compare and Contrast where I use my degree a little bit and take two books that kind of have some similarities, put them side by side and obviously what happens when we put two similar things side by side, we see all of the differences. So I'm going to be a bit more analytical, uh, these are not reviews, there might be a few spoilers in here just so you know. I'm not going to try and lay out the entire plot before you but I'm also not going to hold back when there are interesting things to compare and contrast. So the two books today that we're comparing are Boy Parts by Eliza Clark and American Psycho by Brett Easton Ellis, which I've just realised commits a cardinal sin of a book cover design in that it makes the title of the book much, much smaller than the name of the author. Let's get into it. American Psycho, you might be aware of it, there's a film of it, which is quite good as well, and it's about Patrick Bateman, who is a very privileged Wall Street guy, decides to turn to being a serial killer, I guess? Boy Pass by Eliza Clark is about Irina, who is a photographer in Newcastle. Um, she's sort of had her degree and is sort of now in this limbo, but she takes photographs in her spare time of rather vulnerable young men and puts them in very compromising um, positions. The main comment that I've heard made about these books across the board is that Eliza Clark's boy part is just a gender reversed version of American Psycho and I always feel like this is trying to be a put down of the book but let's just start by breaking down what it would be to create a gender reversed American psycho. We take a very privileged uh, man from Wall Street who can do whatever the fuck he wants, basically. We can't have a woman version of this Wall Street character. Also, Eliza Clark's in the UK in the Northeast, so she wants to base her character there. Okay, how can we even compare two people from these two places with these two genders and two different starts in life? We have a very physical, very violent manipulation of the people around him, the people that he wants to subject to violence, um, and they are all pretty helpless to escape that. How can we give Irina, the protagonist of Boy Parts, the same kind of power? In this there's kind of a, a, a clever um, metaphor in a way if you want to look at it like that, in that photography is like shooting, but not guns, but yeah. There's also a quote in the front of this book. Images which idealise are no less aggressive than the work that makes virtue of plainness. There is an aggression implicit in every use of the camera. So what Eliza wants to make clear here is that Irina's use of the camera is always going to be aggressive. There's always going to be in something in there that is manipulating or forcing something onto the subject. Even if there is inspiration from American Psycho, there is so much more and such a different lens through which boy parts should be viewed, should, could be viewed, that we would be undervaluing it just to see it as a reversal. So now I'm going to talk about the, the voice of these two characters. Uh, both of the, these narrators are unreliable in their own ways. So Patrick Bateman in American Psycho, he has this like lofty idea of himself, which is usually conveyed through his material worth um, and his knowledge of all things around him. There are a couple of chapters in there that ju is just him breaking down a piece of modern music. Modern, I mean, as in Genesis and Whitney Houston, so in the 80s, and him <laughs> basically being God and putting out these like huge lofty opinions. Throughout the novel, we see him put himself on this lofty other level, but every now and again, there is a break in that. 
and there seems to be two sides to Patrick Bateman. The side of him where he views himself as this strong character. He knows everything there is to know about materialism and wealth and how to show that, but also there is this other side to him where he is a bumbling, sweaty, anxious mess who is like, oh, I'm gonna go and pick up some videotapes now at like 11 o'clock at night when he wants to get out of a conversation. And I think that side is probably the more real side of Patrick Bateman and this sort of material worth that he clings onto shows this sort of American shallowness. And then we have Irina in Boy Parts, where she is genuinely unreliable towards the end as she starts to break down mentally. It's very uh, immersive. You're, you're seeing stuff through her eyes and you're seeing things that don't match up with reality. For example, she's in London at one point and she sees and speaks to a character that we know is in Newcastle, that we know is elsewhere. We're shown that breakdown very clearly and very internally, whereas with Pat Bateman we're always on the outside because he is very superficial. That is all he is. I did a bit of research on American Psycho. Obviously there isn't much to research on Boy Parts just yet because it is such a brand new book. There are just reviews mostly, but with American Psycho, I kind of looked into what uh, Bray Easton Ellis' intentions were with the book. He started this book with Pat Bateman, not as a serial killer at all. In fact, he, after spending time with Wall Street guys as uh, research for the novel, he was like, shit, I'm gonna make this guy into a serial killer. So I'm gonna read out a small, small quote. He said that American Psycho was really about the dandification of the American male. So what is the dandification of the American male? Well, it's this obsession over the material, it's the listing throughout the novel of all of the material things that Pat Bateman owns and sees and covets. He, it's pure obsession and it's him telling us every single thing he does and eats and drinks and how all of this is relevant to a brand and I think now that has lost its power somewhat because we are in the age where I tell you about all of the books I read. You can go on Instagram and see what people have had for lunch and that used to be kind of a joke amongst uh, people looking down at people posting their breakfast on Facebook and now it it feels kind of normal. Everyone's taking pictures of their coffee and people's posts where they take photos of their rooms and tell us all of the items and where they've got them from and yeah so I feel like American Psycho has almost lost some of its relevance and power purely because its predictions were real and it's so hard to see that when you're in it, you know? It's so hard to recognise that in American Psycho when our world is so full of that. This could be an interesting book to look back on and see that um, careening decline. Standification is also a kind of a feminization, a, a queerness. In the 80s, these guys almost embraced like this kind of queer male culture. They became more obsessive about clothes and skincare and going to the gym and they almost became these like ideals of um I don't know this sort of like ideal male body. So Pat Bateman seems obsessed with queerness and gayness and AIDS. They're all obsessed with AIDS. If you read this book and checked the amount of times that they mention AIDS and all of that stuff. It's astonishing, there's just so much of it and I think that really comes to a head when we're face to face with a gay character that is very interested in Pat Bateman and appears to have been receiving signals from him and is this definition of this kind of 
burgeoning, sickly, obsessive gay man who is after Pat Bateman, who has made himself this personification of, of gay male perfection in having facials and getting his body in tone and wearing clothes that he's really thought about all of the time. As soon as he finds he's attracted a gay man, he is repulsed. But I also think there is something of Pat Bateman's basically gay and can't admit, um, which it makes a lot of sense if you read it. His um, encounters with women are almost like because they are safe rather than them being what he actually desires and that might be why he violently destroys them um, and kills them. So I've just turned to the pages where um, he is first approached by Lewis Carruthers, who is the gay man, outwardly gay man, even though he's not out in Wall Street. <laughs> and there's just a line where he's like cornered him in a toilet and he's like, I've seen you looking at me, he says, panting. I've noticed your, he gulps, hot body. <laughs> It's just so like overblown and silly. It's like his idea of a gay man rather than an actual real person that's interested in him. It creates that perfect disgust that he feels and I think that sort of personifies the disgust in himself. Um, this person who is obsessed with trying to connect with him uh, but he can't bring himself to kill which I find very interesting and that makes me feel like this person is more real than some of the other people in this book. Um, there's a question about whether a lot of these events actually happen in the books and I think actually they do but there's no answers to it. It's left very open. I'll happily argue about this in the comments. I think actually he has committed a lot of violent acts maybe not all of them. There are characters that will come back again and you realise that he hasn't actually done anything with them, but definitely some of them. There's lots of criticism of this book for the treatment of women and honestly there's a point towards the climax where he's just killing all of the time and there are certain violent acts that he does with the women's bodies. It was horrible, it was horrible to listen to, I don't want to listen to it. I wanted to press pause, but I also just wanted to get through it. I'm someone who has tried not to desensitise myself to violence like that, so it does have a really strong effect on me. Um, it might not have a strong effect on some people, um, or have less of an effect uh, on men, maybe? Or... I don't know. A lot of people have debated how necessary the violence is, and I think Obviously, it is truly, truly horrible. I don't know if it's necessary to the plot, but I think you do need to be pushed to that point of disgust. Because this whole book, I think, is meant to really evoke disgust. One huge difference I found between the two books uh, was that with Boy Parts, I found it uncannily relatable. So, Irina's voice in here, she is clearly a terrible person, but she's also really observationally funny when you're laughing with Irina, you're laughing in a sort of deliciously horrible kind of way at someone else's expense. I'm gonna read you a passage here of um, Eddie from Tesco. You're really cute, I say. He doesn't believe me. You are, honestly, I can't believe you're single. I smile. I'm half telling the truth. He seems like the kind of man whose girlfriends are perpetually younger than him. Like he dates 14 year olds when he's 17, 18 year olds when he's 25. Never enough that it's illegal, but enough that it's weird. I can also see him with some bossy, frumpy pony club type or an adult emo with a dated haircut and a lot of Joker merch. He smiles, just a small smile, and then it drops and he starts chewing on his fingers. Okay, he says, if you say so. I found this particular observation, like, 
I feel like I've met this guy before in a sort of terrible, gossipy, awful way. But there are little bits of, throughout this book that are just really relatable. But even then, I think in this very specific observation of this guy that she is about to demean in such a, a, a terrible way, um, that she's kind of made a small villain out of him. Like, she's suggested that he cannot participate in a relationship with a woman unless there is some power imbalance. And I think that is her projecting something onto him. And also, it's her justifying what she's about to do and justifying her power over him. So even in these funny bits, there's always, I think, layers behind the jokes and I think there's just something about the writing there that's just absolutely fantastic I think she just really gets into our, our heads even if we've got this terrible person we can still find relatable moments that then feels very uncanny so there's me relating with this person who's doing these awful 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 things and then I'm feeling like, oh, and it's shining up this mirror to me that makes me feel so uncomfortable and oddly seen at the same time. And I think that's just a fantastic sign of some really good literature um, where American Psycho has to show us terrible, awful, awful things to make us feel a sense of disgust and this sense of the uncanny and not wanting to ha what's happening to happen. Eliza Clark does that by shining a mirror to us and showing us a real person who is convinced that she is doing not something just, but that this is what she should be doing at this time. And I think that's why I preferred boy parts as a book uh, not only because of its relevance uh, in our times its exploration of trauma and the sort of deeper look at character but also in the uncanniness in the um how these sort of terrible acts really count each one isn't there to e escalate the situation each one really counts and each one is showing something about her. Um, whereas I feel like with American Psycho, it's escalating and escalating. And sometimes it feels without purpose. And that's because it's creating this like materialist, relentless kind of um, capitalist feel of just needing more and more and more and more and more excess and it's without any reason, which I think it does its job, but it doesn't draw me like boy parts does. There's something about boy parts that really shines. And I think if you have a read American Psycho, and that's why you're here watching this video, go and read boy parts. It's not the same experience, of course. It's a, it's a completely different kind of book, but I think it offers some things that almost build upon a basis of American Psycho that build upon this this needless violence um, and this power play with other people. So that's it for today's comparison. Both fantastic books in their own right. I think both very much of their own zeitgeist. American Psycho of the 90s and Boy Parts of the now. Please discuss with me in the comments if you just have any other views on either of these books and you want to like explore further. Obviously this is the first in the series so I'm open to discussion. If you want me to go more essayish and analytical and really bring out the quotes and essays that have already been written on the books that I compare or do you want just more of my opinions and something relatively chill like this. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and you like this kind of stuff. There is going to be more and yeah, have a lovely, lovely week.